The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Emily Kuda, and I am Percona's Senior Manager of Marketing Programs. Um, we're going to get started in just a moment. Um, I just want to conduct a little bit of housekeeping. Um, can you raise your hand to let me know that you can hear me using the GoToWebinar control panel? Ah, great. Okay, next during this webinar, you will um, be on mute. If you have any questions during the discussion, feel free to either, you can email me directly or um, at emily at percona.com, or you can enter them down below in the questions panel. Um, we'll take time to answer as many questions as possible. Um, but in case we run out of time, um, I will send a copy of the questions over to the presenter and we'll do a follow-up blog entry on Percona's database performance blog. So um, after the webinar ends, um, you will get a copy of the recording and the slides um, within 48 hours or less. So with all of that said, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar as we talk about running MongoDB in production. This is part one of our series presented by Percona Senior Technical Operations Architect, Tim Valancourt. Take it away, Tim. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Emily said, this is part one of the series, uh, so we won't cover everything today. And uh, I'll mention later what the dates are for the other two pieces of this. Uh, starting off, uh, I work at Percona, and uh, it's easier to say that I kind of use open source technology to solve problems than uh, kind of be more specific than that. Uh, and it just uh, this is just a list of some of the texts that I work on, but mostly I work on MongoDB at Percona. Uh, we're going to move pretty fast today because there's a lot to cover even in this uh, third of the uh, entire series, uh, backup, security, and monitoring. And the reason I chose these three to start uh, is because I feel they're pretty much the most important things to be worrying about uh, and sometimes they're forgotten. So uh, maybe starting with them will help with that. Uh, quickly with terminology, if you're very new to Mongo, uh, I'm going to use a lot of terms that might sound a bit strange. Uh, so of course, uh, uh, Mongo is a document database. Uh, we're going to talk about fields, which would be a piece of a document or a, a single uh, key value in a, in a document. Uh, collections are similar to tables. If you're from MySQL, databases uh, are the same. And uh, Mongo has a... Uh, type of collection called a cap collection that I'll mention uh, that is a fixed size. So uh, you can only add a certain amount of uh, items to that collection. Uh, replication uses an op log, which actually is a cap collection, uh, and uses a uh, terms primary and secondary. Uh, primary can receive writes, secondary can become a primary or take reads. Uh, an election is the process where uh, we decide who is a primary member, if there's a failure or a startup, and voting is a process that nodes uh, that have votes uh, uh, perform uh, to cause the election to happen. Hidden secondaries are nodes that cannot become a primary in the election. We'll mention that in backups. And uh, when I say majority, I mean uh, most of the members in the replica set. We'll talk about that you know, soon, but uh, in a three-node replica set, a majority would be considered two nodes uh, that contain data. Uh, sharding is usually uh, a cluster containing many replica sets, but uh, it's commonly unknown that sharding can actually have single nodes that aren't replica sets. Um, I, I believe that may have changed in 3.6, but uh, at least uh, before then, uh, you can have a sharded uh, cluster with no replication if that's something you want to do. A shard key is what determines how the data is partitioned across the cluster. Uh, a chunk is a unit of data in the cluster, up to 64 megs. And a partitioned collection is uh, a collection that is spread across the cluster uh, via sharding. Uh, very lastly, uh, sharding uses a, a special server that uh, stores where all the chunks and shards are, called a config server. So enough about the terminology. That's uh, a bit boring. Uh, if you're new, hopefully uh, uh, those terms are, are uh, 
are uh, easy to understand now. Uh, so this quote's important to me, an admin is only worth the backups they keep. Uh, if you have no data at the end of the day, it's, um, I think you, you haven't done your job. Uh, so let's start with backups and let's move on. Uh, MongoDump is a logical backup tool. Uh, so there's kind of two major uh, methods of backup. Uh, that's the default tool uh, that shipped with MongoDB uh, since uh, probably the beginning. Uh, it now supports uh, multi-threaded dumping in 3.2. So even if you don't use 3.2, uh, upgrade to 3.2 for your Mongo dump binary. Uh, uh, you'll get multi-threaded dumps even if you're not using 3.2. Uh, same with uh, the next line, uh, GZIP compression was added to uh, the 3.2 and above uh, Mongo dump, and that compression happens in parallel. Uh, so by default, it's dumping, I, I believe, two or four collections at once, and uh, you can be GZIPing those <laughs> at the same time. Uh, very important line third is the dumping of the op log for, for single node consistency is uh, possible with MongoDump. And uh, it's also replica, replica set aware. So you, you can say, uh, here's a list of servers only dump from the secondary or primary or nearest uh, uh, read preferences is something you can look up, but that's uh, a nice feature. The process it uses to do this is almost a uh, uh, kind of like a, cli a, a client uh, application, just dumping all the data. It issues a fine query on every collection, stores the data per collection in a file. And uh, if you're using the oplog dumping feature, it is storing the oplog in a .json file called oplog.bson. Uh, so that's how uh, MongoDump works. It's useful for upgrades of very old systems. If you're jumping major versions, uh, uh, 2.6 to 3.4 would be a good example. You would want to use a logical backup, I feel, instead of taking a binary backup just to ensure that uh, the entire process uh, from the client perspective made it. Uh, I've never seen any cases of corruption in, in uh, uh, various uh, storage engines in, in MongoDB, but it is possible. So it's, uh, it's a nice safeguard to know that it was able to come all the way over the client API, get stored as a file. Uh, instead of just taking the database storage files. Uh, the next line I kind of just alluded to, uh, it, it, it allows you to be protected from binary level corruption or storage engine corruption. If for some reason Wired Tiger had a, had a bug in 2.6, uh, or sorry, it wasn't, didn't exist in 2.6, 3.2, uh, you can know that backing up the Wired Tiger files, uh, or, or sorry, taking a logical backup uh, is not going to have any of that corruption where taking the, the binary files might. Uh, but again, I've never seen it. Uh, it's also great for exporting and importing to a different architecture of CPU. Doesn't happen very often, but if you're moving to, let's say, ARM processors, uh, you would have to use a logical backup instead of copying the binary files because of the architecture difference. Uh, the index metadata only is in a logical backup, so uh, this is the most important thing to remember. There's no index data in the backups. It's just a definition of how to rebuild it. Uh, expect, if you have many indexes, this to be the longest part of the process, uh, not the actual restoring of the data when you, when you bring your system back up from one of these logical backups. It's going to rebuild all the indexes in serial and very large systems of hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes. Uh, are going to be waiting very, very long for for the indexes to be rebuilt. Uh, it's also not sharding aware. We'll get to that. Uh, if you issue a Mongo dump backup against a sharded cluster, it's not going to be entirely consistent. It's going to just try its it, it, its best, basically. Uh, the limitations are it's very slow because it's fetching from a storage engine, throwing it over TCP, uh, unpacking it over TCP and storing it again as BSON files. So very inefficient for, for everyone. And uh, currently, the wire protocol compression added in 3.4, default in 3.6 is not supported with MongoDump. Uh, so if that's important to you, uh, please vote on this issue, tool 1668 with MongoDB to add that. Uh, currently, it will be uh, uncompressed uh, backups as you, as you take a MongoDump, even in 3.6. Binary 
Well, backups are uh, something I've already mentioned. Uh, as a comparison, binary level backups take the actual files that storage engines store on disk as the backup instead of uh, dumping all of the documents out from the uh, server's uh, API or uh, from the server shell, basically. So uh, basically, you, you can perform this uh, using a cold backup, which would be shutting down MongoDB and copying the files. Of course, that takes an outage. Uh, some smarter ways would be LVM snapshotting the, the file system or using the Percona hot backup feature, uh, which is available in our Percona server for MongoDB fork of MongoDB. Uh, also in MongoDB, MongoDB Enterprise uh, for a fee. Uh, MMAP v1 is not supported in any of these. Uh, the benefits of this binary backup are it's very fast and the indexes are included uh, in the backup because we're, we're backing up the actual stored files of MongoDB. So uh, the restore process is very simple. You replace the files and restart the, the instance. Uh, the limitations or drawbacks would be it takes more space to store a binary level backup. Uh, the logical backups take less space to store with gzip and other things. Uh, the CPU architecture that I mentioned uh, in logical exists with binary. You, you, you can't move uh, backups from a different CPU to another 64-bit uh, from 32 or ARM from 64-bit uh, AMD, things like that. Uh, you could cascade corruption, I mentioned. If something terrible happened to MongoDB, uh, you could be backing up the files that have that corruption. And the batteries aren't included. I, I'd like to say here that you, you, you kind of have to write some scripting around binary backups. You have to write a script to do the, the LVM snapshot or uh, write a script to use create backup, uh, the Percona hot backup feature to, uh, to perform it using cron or something like that. I've already mentioned how cold backup works under process here. I'll move on. Uh, our hot backup feature is a admin command that I recently wrote a blog post about. So I'll be quick on this, and you can read that, uh, that more. Uh, but it works for WireTiger and RocksDB. And uh, this admin command will create a full binary backup of your database on Percona Mongo binaries. The architecture uh, for setting up backups uh, is something to think about. Uh, you could run backups directly against your replica set that your application uses, but that could slow it down. And maybe that's an important, important time in the day, or even if you think it's not an important time in the day, something uh, becomes popular or trending, and uh, that's very slow. So uh, things to think about when you're writing scripts for backups is the replica set could change, the primary could move around. Uh, make sure that you're accounting for that in your scripts. And I just mentioned it, the impact on live nodes. Uh, one of the easiest things I, I could say to avoid these problems is, is use a hidden secondary. If you have a three-node system, uh, add a fourth node for backups. Unfortunately, it does add to your to your costs. But uh, using this hidden true field, uh, setting a setting up a hidden secondary means that it could never become primary and is not uh, read from the application. So it uh, can't really cause any impact by taking a backup from a hidden secondary. You can also use replica set tagging, which is a great feature. You can add key values to different nodes in a replica set. I have an example at the bottom here of adding role, uh, just a key, key value role. Uh, one I've used in this example is backup, and one role is application. And uh, you can probably guess that the application would use the replica set tag role application as uh, its uh, replica set tag, meaning it would only read or write to nodes that, uh, that have that tag that you've man manually set. And uh, backup could, uh, your backup process could use the tag backup, uh, role backup. And that gets to the tool that uh, I'm actually the, the main developer and maintainer on for Percona, uh, the MongoDB consistent backup tool that we made to solve a few problems, mainly the one I mentioned that sharding backups aren't consistent. It's a best effort. Uh, so this tool is written in Python and is mainly, uh, as I'm saying here, uh, made to solve that exact problem. 
replica set and sharded cluster awareness, uh, cluster-wide point-in-time consistency. Uh, every other feature it has is kind of secondary to those goals. Uh, I'll go back, sorry. The, uh, another feature it has is inline oplog backup. Uh, Mongo dump actually uh, performs a oplog backup at the very end of the backup. So if your backup took 10 hours, uh, you actually have to have at least those 10 hours of oplog to take the backup. Uh, this tool would actually tail it from the very beginning so that you're getting all those changes uh, without having to go back the whole 10 hours to get that, that oplog. Uh, we also support uploading uh, to cloud storage, archiving, and it's multi-threaded. Uh, kind of already mentioned this, but it's low impact. So uh, we're trying to uh, do some tricks to make sure that we don't impact your, your application in this uh, tool. Uh, so the, you, you can run the risk of running things on a primary. This tool ensures that never happens. And it also scores nodes uh, considering the lag priority, uh, health and state, uh, whether or not it's a hidden secondary, uh, which is heavily preferred by the tool. and uh, last point is very important. It fails if chosen uh, the primary as uh, the backup source because uh, we, we never want to impact the primary, which we, we can pretty much guarantee is used by the application. So the code doesn't allow that to happen. Uh, the feature that we don't have is incremental backups. That's going to be worked on uh, no ETA at this time, but we're, we're uh, kind of uh, planning that right now. Uh, same with the binary level backups. Right now, we only support logical. After all the uh, hype I just gave, uh, binary level backups, we don't quite support it yet, but it is a very complex uh, thing to support. Uh, we need to add more uh, notification methods. PagerDuty might be one, and a restore helper tool would be great. Uh, your awesome idea here is the last kind of joke here that it is written in Python, and we do submit or uh, we do accept uh, changes uh, to the code if, if you want to help. Uh, restoring one of these backups is just a Mongo restore. Uh, I've just put out a blog for that. Uh, so uh, currently, because we just use Mongo dump uh, within this tool, a Mongo restore is how you would restore uh, using the oplog replay flag. Uh, sorry if I'm moving fast here, but uh, there's a lot more to cover here. And uh, the blog that I have just put out on restores covers this slide. Uh, to restore an entire cluster from this uh, tool, you would uh, restore each shard from the backup. Uh, so every shard will have its own backup subdirectory. Using Mongo restore, you would uh, restore that. Sorry, I've gone too far. And uh, you would start each Mongo S process uh, and test. Uh, and I'm actually missing one bullet here uh, that I will send a correction out for that you would have to restore the config servers uh, in between these two bullet points. Uh, the Mongo restore each shard and start Mongo S process uh, so that uh, the uh, config servers also have that backup. Uh, lastly, if uh, for some reason your hosts have changed or you're restore restoring to an entirely different environment of host names and ports, you would have to update those uh, in the config metadata. Uh, we'll have a blog coming out uh, uh, probably in the next month to explain that, a full cluster restore. Uh, security, think of the network like a public place is a quote I like to think about. Uh, you wouldn't leave uh, an unlocked server in the middle of a downtown city, so let's uh, work with that assumption. Uh, and this is a great slide that authorization uh, is a feature in Mongo that has built-in roles uh, that restricts, uh, A, the access to the server at all, uh, requiring a password, and then also what a user can do once they're logged in. I uh, don't want to go through all the user types. I suggest you go through them and, and look at them. But uh, I think the most important takeaway here is make sure your application only has the read-write uh, permission on a single database. Or if it has, or if your application uses many databases, uh, only those databases. So uh, that's avoiding that it could take over admin functions or anything risky. Uh, so don't don't ever give admin access to an application, make sure it's just read-write. And that includes uh, the application will still be able to make indexes, drop collections, drop data, create data, all the normal things an application should need to do. 
uh, just make sure that you never give it anything like uh, user admin or anything with the name admin in the role. Also, always enable authorization first. Once an application is written, I'm, I've never once been able to successfully roll out authorization once an app is out in production. Just a personal experience there. Uh, you can also customize uh, roles and specify uh, custom roles uh, to the server that uh, aren't uh, aren't already defined. If you have a very specific way that something needs to access Mongo, file system access is very overlooked. This is just uh, literally if I log on to one of your servers and get a shell, what can I see? Uh, I would say nine or eight times out of ten, when I audit a Mongo install, I'm able to read either the data path or the log file or both. So this is a very important slide to me because it's probably the most common mistake I ever see. And what I mean by that is if I log onto a server as the user Tim, which uh, hopefully you're not running your Mongo server as in Linux, uh, I, I would, I'm typically able to read the log file, which contains queries. Uh, imagine if you're processing credit cards, I could read the credit cards right out of the log file. Uh, also, the data path is generally accessible on most systems I find where I could just copy the wired tiger files and uh, download them somewhere. And uh, if I was an attacker, of course. So uh, look out for those. Make sure that your data path is only accessible to the user and group that Mongo runs as. Uh, the first point I'm mentioning here is run Mongo not as root, run, run Mongo as probably MongoD or MongoDB usernames. Uh, most binaries deploy a user, make sure it's running as that, and make sure the data path is only readable by that user's group and username. Same with the log file. So, uh, and then basically after that, do the test I just mentioned. Log on as yourself, try and read the data path or the log file. You should get a permission denied and have to uh, escalate pr privileges to read that. Uh, think, think like an attacker. Uh, key files are included, so SSL certificates, and the internal authentication probably should have mode 600. Uh, here's an example of me being able to read a log file as the user Tim on a host here. I'm just doing an ID command to show you that I'm not the MongoD user, uh, and then I'm tailing one log from the bottom of the MongoD log file, which I shouldn't be able to do. Network security, network access, is very important. Mongo is great because it only uses a single TCP port, unlike a lot of Java apps or other things out there that have a JMX port and separate ports for things. Uh, uh, everything is just one port. Define that port, usually 27017, and the client API replication and sharding all happens over that port. So your network admin's job is very easy in the firewall, one, one set of rules typically. Uh, sharding is uh, interesting because only the Mongo S needs to be accessed by the application. Uh, that's uh, something uh, that I that I find isn't implemented. That you, you you should actually block access to all your data nodes in Mongo uh, to the application on a on a network level. They only need to be able to talk to the routing process called Mongo S, uh, which uh, is the is the gateway into the sharded cluster. So everything else doesn't actually need to be accessible to the application, only those Mongo S processes. So something to think about. Uh, replication, if you're using replication without sharding, you have to be able to access all nodes. Uh, so that, that's uh, a drawback. So in sharding, you could really lock it down to just the routers. Replication only, just a replica set, you still need access to everything. Uh, internal authentication is another great feature in Mongo uh, that just uses a certificate or a password or a string, basically, to authenticate the, the nodes so that someone can't man in the middle and uh, cause a dump of the data using initial sync. Uh, creating a dedicated network segment for databases is great. If you can create a VLAN just for Mongo, that's perfect. Uh, if you can move your database nodes to Amazon VPC instead of a public network, that's great. Um, but the last point is probably the most important one. Don't allow MongoDB to talk to the internet. And the, the main reason I say this is if someone breaks into your network, gets to your database servers, they're going to try and upload the database data uh, offsite to somewhere else. 
So uh, this is something I almost add as a Nagios check or, or anything to database nodes, because it's that important to me that you should never have a route to the internet on a database node. Uh, you, you should try and curl google.com and get an error, because um, it, it's just too dangerous for someone to be able to upload uh, your database data to, to elsewhere. And uh, the, the, the attacks that happened over the last two years to Mongo databases, you may have seen in the press, uh, relied on that, uh, being able to upload the data elsewhere. So the easiest way to do that is just remove a default route to the internet and uh, make sure that your systems can only route to the VLANs or subnets uh, that, uh, that they need to. System access, uh, I'm not sure if system is the right word, but uh, um, what I mean with this, this first point is make sure that only database administrators can access uh, uh, database servers, uh, whichever way that happens with VPNs or, or network firewalls. Uh, so generally, if, uh, if, if my job is not related in needing to access a database, just make it so that user can't actually get to the server. And that's not necessarily to make someone's job uh, hard or, or say you're not allowed in here, but uh, just in case their password is simple and compromised, there's a smaller attack surface when only three people are able to get onto a server instead of 1,000. Uh, it's just a much easier job for the, the, the server uh, or sorry, security uh, team to, uh, to understand what's going on when it's a smaller list of people that have the keys to that server. Uh, I mentioned I could read the log file on the server, so the second point is really interesting. If, if I have an SSH shell to a server and no, no access to anything else, that's still a dangerous situation because I can read the log file or at least try. I can try and read the data path. These are all things you can try and do with a shell. You can also try and execute exploits using a shell, even if you don't have any other access like sudo. Uh, SE Linux, I'm going to skip over this, uh, but I have another blog on that, that SE Linux is a great tool to use to make it very difficult for an attacker to do anything on a system once they're on it. Uh, and our Percona binaries on Red Hat and CentOS uh, deploy by default a SE, SE Linux profile that allows you to set SE Linux to full enforcing mode and uh, anything misbehaving on the server will be denied access. External authentication is a cool feature that Percona Server has that allows you to uh, hook into LDAP. Uh, ours is a little different than uh, MongoDB Enterprises, uh, but is able to achieve the same thing in the end. And that's great if you need to change passwords quickly uh, on a large scale. Uh, this is how you just create a user and how you'd authenticate using an LDAP user. So it's a little more work on the shell, but not too bad. Uh, MongoDB has SSL and TLS connection support since 2.6, and uh, that's a great thing to enable because it mostly pools those connections. You're not really paying too much of a cost uh, to open and close SSL connections, but make sure your driver uh, is pooling to the server uh, so that it, it, it by itself is not uh, adding any cost. Uh, you can also authenticate with uh, SSL certificates, so that's an interesting thing. To do instead of passwords, you can use a very large SSL certificate that is stronger than a password, in my opinion, and also benefit from certificate uh, authorities and all the cool tools that SSL certificates have with its uh, verifying. Uh, encryption at rest uh, is possible in MongoDB Enterprise, uh, not yet possible or uh, not currently possible in Percona Server for MongoDB, aside from using a block device encryption uh, under MongoDB. Uh, and we have documentation. I believe it's published now or coming soon on how to do that. Uh, but uh, you can achieve the same, same result with those servers. A uh, few more steps with the MongoDB server for, for, for uh, ser Percona Server for MongoDB, I should say. You can also go with application level encryption. This is great if you have a lot of application servers because you're scaling out the cost of encryption. It does slow things down. So if you want your, your database to worry about being very fast, you could 
actually just put the encryption in your application code. And there's a few benefits to that. I just mentioned one that it scales nicely, uh, but also uh, in large organizations, uh, maybe you don't want your database administrators to be able to read uh, certain pieces of data. Uh, so, or uh, if someone stole the disk, uh, they shouldn't be able to read only certain fields in the data, but not the rest. Uh, maybe there's only one out of 20 fields in your document that actually needs to be encrypted. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to using application level encryption. Uh, those are just a few I mentioned there. This is kind of a duplicate, uh, uh, but uh, good to just uh, mention again, single TCP port, make sure you restrict it to as few nodes as possible and ensuring that really for the application uh, only needs to be Mongo S, uh, the router, and the router needs access to everything else. So that's a nice way to kind of fence off the ability for the application server to connect to too many things. Uh, I kind of mentioned it earlier, you could move all your uh, uh, networking for MongoDB to its own VLAN, that would be great. Uh, even better would be uh, a replication VLAN and a client VLAN. But that's getting pretty, pretty complicated and uh, expensive if, if, you, if you don't have that kind of hardware. In MongoDB 3.6, uh, source IP restrictions were finally added. Uh, I think that's long overdue, but it's nice it's here now. You can restrict a user based on its IP addresses or ranges that it came from, just like MySQL has had for quite a long time. And uh, that's a great feature to, to have. And I think you should use it as, as long as you know uh, what your IP ranges are going to be. Uh, in my example here, I'm saying that 1010.19 is a VLAN that I know I want to trust. Maybe that's my application servers. Always try and add that just from the beginning if you know that, because uh, uh, imagine how many how many um, holes you've closed off now because only that slash 24 and localhost uh, are able to use this user. That's great. Uh, we've made it through security, but there's one feature I forgot to add here that I uh, will put into our troubleshooting, which is the Kirkona auditing uh, feature, uh, auditing plugin that actually uh, dumps a BSON file uh, containing a log of all actions that have happened in the server. That's a great thing to cover that I'll cover in the third uh, part of this series. Uh, monitoring, uh, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Uh, I'm not getting directly at a point there, but I just wanted to kind of spark some ideas in your head with that. Uh, my methodology with monitoring is monitor often and uh, monitor a lot is probably the way I'd put it. Uh, I've worked at orgs where 60 seconds or 300 seconds every five minutes is how often the server is monitored and that's not gonna be enough, especially if you consider a user using your site uh, for maybe just a few seconds a day uh, just to see, oh, well, what's new in my inbox? Okay, nothing. Uh, that's just a few seconds that they were using your site, and what if it was slow? You're, you're not really uh, seeing the problem happen if you pulled um, once now and one, once five minutes later, and nothing is slow. Um, the other point uh, to my methodology is make sure that you don't just have a tool for monitoring your database and a tool for monitoring Linux or your operating system. Make sure you can monitor both of those things together because at the end of the day, they're part of the same thing. Uh, I like to call the operating system the air in the room uh, that the database is in. Uh, it's the air that the database is breathing. Uh, you also have to know exactly what's going on in the operating system to know why the database is performing a certain way. Uh, monitor a lot is important. Uh, uh, d don't just buy a cheap uh, VM server somewhere and uh, you know just store a few metrics about your server. Try and store as many metrics as you possibly can, I feel, um, until uh, you have to scale your, your, your hardware to, to handle it because uh, it, it is that crucial to, to have. Uh, thankfully, we'll get to a tool that will help you with that. Uh, my process for monitoring is add monitoring, of course. Make sure you have something. Uh, use the monitoring when something breaks. Uh, someone says, this looks funny, or a user said, 
this timed out, uh, go look at the monitoring and see if there's any indication of an event happening. Uh, if not, OK, move on. Uh, iterate and improve if you know why uh, there's nothing in the monitoring. And add a graph for anything that made you SSH to a host. Uh, we, we don't have too many hours in the day, so it, it's great if you can say, uh, this problem caused me to have to log on to a VPN, SSH to a node, read the log file for half an hour, just to find this thing, whatever it is. Imagine if you, after that incident, added a graph for that and moved on. You've just saved quite a bit of time. And especially consider that someone beside you or someone who was away on vacation maybe just didn't know that process, didn't work it the same way as you did. Maybe it took them four hours uh, a year from now. Add that graph and save a lot of time. Uh, the other thing is review with someone unfamiliar with the problem. Uh, sometimes I've worked on teams where someone is just great at solving that problem. It's not documented. And we really hope that person's around when things break. Um, make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so the way I do that is if I ever have a production incident and someone was away on vacation and comes back, show them the graphs from that day and ask them, can you guess what happened here? If they have no clue what happened, you need more graphs. Uh, it needs to be obvious to anyone that something has changed in the, in the system. Important metrics to monitor are somewhat obvious in the database. You want to uh, monitor operations, inserts, deletes, uh, things that will kind of explain reads and writes to the disk uh, and such. Cache activity, uh, checkpoint and compaction performance is important with uh, more advanced storage engines. Uh, concurrency tickets, um, it, it, are you hitting limits with concurrency, basically? Uh, documents and index scanning, that's great for seeing uh, changes in the application usage. And uh, engine-specific details are great if you have to get that far into uh, the stack. I've broken down CPU here because I think it's important. Uh, for operating system, CPU is important. Uh, but often, uh, I, I find users don't know exactly what's going on with the CPU. They just know the percent used. Uh, so let's break this down a little bit. If you see CPU used, uh, there's two types of CPU, and there's two percentages Linux has. One is called user, and one is called system. Uh, user is MongoDB. MongoDB runs in user land in Linux. So any percent used in user is MongoDB related or any other programs running on your system. Uh, so SSH, uh, VI, any, any shell commands that you're running uh, are user, user CPU percent. Specifically in Mongo, that's compression if you're using RocksDB or WideTiger. Encryption if you're using encryption, sorting, aggregations, and groupings. These are all things that will use CPU. So if you see a spike in user CPU, you can kind of look at that list of three things there. There might be a few extras and uh, start to wonder, hmm, uh, maybe there was more sorting, something changed, someone ran an aggregate that hasn't happened before. On the system side, that's a, a separate percent used uh, connection. So the kernel is responsible for opening and closing network connections. So uh, uh, that's a percentage used there. Same with IO scheduling. Uh, the others are a bit obvious with the database that they use disk bandwidth. Um, and those are good things to monitor in your situation. Uh, Percona has uh, created an open source suite of tools uh, for doing this with MySQL and Mongo, ProxySQL, and I believe uh, some support for uh, Postgres um, based on open source uh, uh, systems. I won't go too far into it. Here's a nice little demo screenshot of PMM uh, that we like to call it for short uh, that will offer a lot of the best practices I just mentioned correlating the database to the operating system. Uh, things like that. Uh, this series is to be continued, I already mentioned, uh, in two more parts. Uh, the next one is on April 26th at the same time uh, block that we're in right now, and the same time block we're in now for May 3rd, uh, 2018. Uh, 
So uh, come back for, for those. Uh, there's quite a few other sections to cover. And of course, we just covered uh, monitoring backups and security today. Uh, I'm just going to skip the question slide to quickly show uh, that uh, we have Percona Live coming up. Uh, the US version, or uh, uh, yeah, the North American version of uh, Percona Live. Uh, all the details are here. And uh, with that, I will ask uh, for some questions if there are any. Great. Thank you so much for that, Tim. Um, all right. So uh, at this time, go ahead and enter your questions field. Uh, questions down in the questions field down below. Uh, reminder, if we can't address them all, we'll do a follow-up blog post. Um, all right. So our first question is, does the Bercona server for Mongo community supports SSL authentication and SSL transport available on 10 Gen Mongo commercial version? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know the specifics of 10 Gen commercial edition, but I want to say yes, um, that it is the same, um, just with the, with the, with the caveat that I, I haven't actually seen Tengen's uh, community edition. But what I can say is uh, our SSL support is based on open SSL libraries, uh, the same as the community server of MongoDB uh, current uh, 3.2 and, and, and so on. Uh, so, so what I can say is you, you definitely can use encryption connections and authentication. It's just uh, possibly uh, Tengen might be using a different algorithm or SSL library. Thank you. Let's see, our next question is, can you elaborate on the do not allow MongoDB to talk to the internet? That's in terms of like the outbound connection or inbound connection to Mongo from the outside. Yeah, uh, it's worth elaborating on for forever almost. Um, uh, basically, what I mean is uh, I, if you try and, and, and access Percona.com or, or really any website on your database, uh, that is a security risk. And uh, I, I don't remember the name of the Mongo attack that happened uh, in the press maybe one and a half years ago, I believe, within the last two years ago. Uh, about 30,000 nodes were, were compromised with a note that said, we've taken your data, uh, pay us money to get it back. Uh, that happened to about 30,000 uh, servers. The reason that happened was the attackers were able to, A, access the server somehow via the internet, uh, which is bad. But almost worse is the servers themselves were able to upload to the internet. Uh, so what that means is once they got onto the servers, whichever way they did, uh, they were able to just FTP or connect to uh, Dropbox or, or something and upload the backup of the database. So what I mean when I say don't let the server talk to the internet, I mean make sure that you only have routes to your private IP addresses. Uh, so if you run the route-n command or IP route command on Linux, if you see that there's a default gateway, that means uh, you can potentially connect to anything. Uh, ask your network admins or sysadmins to restrict that to just the subnets that Mongo runs on. So if all your databases run on 10.10.1 uh, subnet, uh, make sure that's the only routable subnet on your servers so that if an attacker gets on that server somehow and says, I'm going to upload this backup to Dropbox, uh, Linux will say dropbox.com, host name not found, or uh, no route to host, basically. Thank you. Um, let's see, our next question is, are, is there any documentation uh, talking about the setup of LDAP in RHEL rel using PAM for SASL? Uh, yeah. Our, well, I'll give two answers to that. We we use uh, PAM uh, SASL as uh, kind of the base for our LDAP support, so that part will work in Red Hat. Uh, the documentation, I believe, exists, but I think we should, uh, Emily and I should probably write that down to just double check uh, if it does or it does not. But uh, yes, it's possible uh, with uh, with PAM on, on uh, RHEL. Thank you. Let's see. Our next question is, 
What's the recommended strategy to handle permissions when we're deploying a third-party app that creates the DB at runtime? That's a good question. Um, but it's a tough one to answer, but I think the, the best way to do it is if the creation of the database is completely automatic, uh, at, at least have two years that your application uses, one that is uh, after initiation that is um, maybe just called app, and a second one called app admin that is able to uh, only have access to create a user. Uh, so what that means is uh, that user is it's fairly limited in, limited in its ability that it can only create a user, and uh, the application user separately would uh, would be used by the application. So really, that's the best answer I could give you is just kind of separate the administrative part. Uh, so, so at least uh, that part can be blocked uh, if, if it needed to in a certain uh, scenario, or at least your logs will show uh, separate users' uh, actions for those things. Uh, you could also look at custom uh, user-defined uh, roles. Uh, they get very detailed on which actions can be performed, and there might be a way for for you to to restrict it even further than uh, what I'm what I'm talking about. Uh, that actually means that you specify a a role to uh, in the systems uh, database, or sorry, system database of Mongo, uh, and then after that, you can use create user to use that custom role that might be a little more uh, tied down. But uh, I, I see the purpose of the question. Uh, you have to specify the database up front. So uh, yeah, if you don't know what the database name is, it becomes difficult. And I see, I see that's probably why you're asking. Thank you. Um, let's see. So our next question is, um, so, What's like the comparison for uh, you know Percona server for MongoDB versus like the Mongo Community Edition? Uh, well, our goal uh, first, firstly, our goal is to make it as similar as reasonably possible. Uh, reasonable is uh, kind of underlined that uh, we we try and make features that will be useful to a lot of people. Uh, so there are some really enterprise features that uh, we haven't heard too many people in the community ask for that we don't actually support uh, feature to feature with MongoDB Enterprise. Uh, but we're, we're making it as close as possible. Uh, I believe the best answer I could give you is probably look at the blog, I think, that just came out on the Percona performance blog for uh, comparison feature to feature. Uh, but I think the main parts where we uh, <clears throat> excuse me, don't have parity would be uh, database encryption uh, within the engine and also some uh, extra security methods uh, that, that uh, aside from LDAP that we don't support today. I might be missing a few. Thanks. Uh, uh I'll just... Uh, Continue up a little bit. Sorry that um, we, we. I'll just highlight a few major ones that uh, the hot backup feature uh, MongoDB Enterprise has. Uh, we also uh, audit. Uh, uh, auditing is the same kind of story, and uh, LDAP is kind of the same story. Uh, just just to name a few. Thanks, Jim. Um, let's see, our next question is, do you happen to know when Percona is going to release um, the uh, its version of MongoDB Server uh, 3.6? Yes. Uh, well, actually, I should say no. Uh, I know it's very soon, as in days to weeks, but um, sorry, I don't have the date on the top of my head. I know it's basically ready for release. Um, so, um, this is kind of a, a follow-up question, uh, on the LDAP question. So, uh, regarding the PAM, uh, so when they, they use it on the community edition, no problem, but when they use 
uh, the Bracona server for MongoDB version, it does not work on RHEL, Braille? Right. Uh, yes, our implementation is not exactly the same. Um, so uh, I, I couldn't talk about the exact specifics, but I'd definitely go look at our blog because uh, just switching from community to our, our version is not exactly uh, the same. There is definitely a difference either in the configuration file of MongoDB or the configuration of PAM. And uh, I don't want to guess what it is for you, but definitely um, there, there is a difference in the way that MongoDB implemented it and Percona. Oh, sorry about so, that. That was uh, the definitely... enterprise edition, not the community. That was my bad. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. Um, I believe it only was in the enterprise edition. Uh, um, but uh, uh, basically, the two implementations are different. So I would probably go look at our documentation or uh, a blog that Adamo from Percona did and uh, just kind of check everything from the start. Either the, the MongoDB config file or PAM uh, could be where the difference is. Uh, and when I say PAM, I mean the etc pam.d uh, directory, I believe. you for that okay all right so um, we are getting close to the top of the hour um, if there are any questions that maybe you thought of that uh, you know you forgot to ask on today's webinar um, you can still reach me at uh, Emily at Bracona.com and I'll make sure to forward those questions on to Tim um, and then uh, today I will um, I have recorded everybody's questions as well um, so in case for those that we needed to do uh, follow up offline, um, we'll reach out to you separately. Um, so uh, with that said, you know, thank you so much, everybody, for attending today's webinar. Um, as we talked about running MongoDB in production, um, as a reminder, there are two more parts to this. So stay tuned. Um, we'll be sending out email invitations or you can register online. Um, if you want to save your spot early. Um, and um, we'll see you on future webinars. Thank you so much, Tim, for presenting today. Thanks, no problem. And uh, see you at the, uh, the next parts, everyone.